Hi, welcome to part two of this video. If you have not watched part one, pause the video and go watch part one and come back to part two. Now in part one, we studied history to look for patterns. Because we said that history doesn't always repeat exactly, but it often rhymes. And if you fail to learn from history, you're doomed to repeat it. And if you look at all the past bubbles and crashes, the dot-com crash, the financial crisis, the tulip mania, it's basically the same movie again and again because we can't help ourselves as human beings, we always screw ourselves up. It's the same movie but different actors. So after studying all these past bubbles and crashes, what patterns do we observe? We can observe seven warning signs of a bubble. Let's go through the seven warning signs right now. Warning sign number one is when the price of the asset goes far beyond the fundamental intrinsic value of the asset and the price becomes unsustainable. So in any asset, there's always a fundamental value. So for example, this could be the fundamental value of a business of real estate where the, the value goes up this way. Now, because of greed and speculation, the price at times would be driven much higher, right? So usually when the price goes up, it goes up in a 45 degree angle, like so. But after a while, again, intense greed speculation, the price goes parabolic, which means it goes up 90 degrees, the price goes, whoa, all the way up there. Right? So think about it like a rubber band. When you stretch a rubber band too fast and too high, it's gonna eventually snap back. So once prices get too far above their fundamental intrinsic value, they will eventually burst and the prices will snap back to reality. So the question would be, how do you know what's the fundamental value of the asset? What should it really be worth? Well, for productive assets, what the asset is worth is based on what it produces. So again, for example, for real estate, it's worth based on the cash flows it produces in terms of rental income. For business, a business is worth based on the earnings and cash flow it produces. So here are some general rules of thumb. If you invest in a property and you rent it out, the rental you collect should cover the mortgage. It should cover the mortgage. In fact, I remember when property was cheap, I was an investor in my early days. When I bought a property, I rented it out, the rental could cover the mortgage payment and I had a lot of extra left behind. It's a positive cash flow property. But now property prices are also getting expensive. And now you find that your mortgage payments are higher than the rental income you can collect. So it could be a negative cash flow. That's how you know when property becomes expensive. And when mortgage payments become three to four times higher than the rent you could collect, it's a freaking bubble. And that's what happened during the housing bubble eventually. So that, that's one clue. Another clue is to look at the rental yield of the property. So in general, a property's rental yield should be about five, six, seven percent. That's a healthy range. But the moment the rental yield falls way below 3%, it goes to 2% or 1%, hey, it tells you again, the property is too expensive, it's in a bubble. So in every asset, there are ways you can measure using these metrics. Now, how about stocks? Again, remember, when you invest in stocks, you're buying businesses. So how do you value a business? How do you know what a business is worth? Now, always remember this. A business is a money-making machine. That's it. So what the machine is worth is based on how much cash the machine can generate over its lifetime. So there are many ways we calculate that value, right? My favorite is to use a discounted cash flow method where we uh, project the future cash flow of the business or the net income and we discount the present value. So I use this intrinsic value calculator and my students get all this in our investing course and using this calculator, we can project the future cash flow of any stock. So for example, if you look at Microsoft based on its projected cash flow and you discount it to present value, the intrinsic value is about $267. And as today's price of 262, it is more or less fairly priced. It is not cheap, it is not expensive, it's fairly priced. But if you look at certain stocks like JD.com, which is a Chinese e-commerce company, now that looks really cheap right now. 
because you can see that the intrinsic value is uh, in US dollars, 100 US dollars. But currently, because of the correction in Chinese tech companies, it's trading at $76, and that's, that's making it 24% undervalued. And that's why I've been buying shares of JD.com. And when the share price gets above the intrinsic value, it becomes expensive. And if the share price goes like 50, 100% above the intrinsic value, it becomes a bubble, okay? Now, how about bonds, for example? Now, bonds, again, uh, when bond yields or the bond interest rate falls below inflation, bonds are expensive. If you look at treasury bonds, you know, I talked about treasury bonds being in a bubble about two years ago. And sure enough, the bubble burst late last year when the treasury bond yield fell below 1%, the 10-year treasury bond. So when bond yields go way below inflation, bonds are expensive because it means that if you invest in a bond, you are not even beating inflation. And that doesn't make sense from a long-term perspective, bonds will collapse. Now, when it comes to non-productive assets, like, again, gold or cryptocurrencies, it's really hard to value the fundamentals because the value is pretty psychological and that makes it very dangerous because if people think it's worth, if people think Bitcoin is worth 50,000, sure, it's worth 50,000, 50, right? And if people believe that Bitcoin is worth 100,000, sure, it could go to 100,000, right? But if suddenly people start to say, wait, I think it's worth you know, 5,000, it goes to 5,000. And that's the danger with non-productive assets because it is worth what people think it's worth. It's all based on confidence. So be careful about non-productive assets. Now, one clue is to look at the price action, the price movement. So generally, when prices are on an uptrend, they move up in a 45-degree angle. And that's fine. The moment you see prices start to move up in a 90 degree angle, we call it parabolic. It goes up 90 degrees. That's usually a sign that the bubble is forming. That's when extreme greed takes place. It's like a rubber band again. And that's when eventually it's going to come back down. But of course, timing the exact top is not always easy. But if you look at all past bubbles and crashes, they always end up with this 90 degree angle. Why? Because the market is like sex. It feels the best just before it ends, right? Feels the best climax, yeah, <laughs> right? So if you take a look at, let's take a look at some recent, I would call them mini bubbles. They're not major, but mini bubbles that burst eventually. The first would be gold, right? So gold had a really great run, as you can see, 45 degrees, and then eventually 90 degrees, boom, and it starts to go down, right? Bonds, TLT represents the bond ETF, the 20th treasury bonds. And I said last year that bonds are in a bubble. Why? Because yields were falling below uh, 1%, and the price action went parabolic. Again, look at that, 90 degrees, uh, sorry, 45 degrees, and it goes, whoa! 90 degrees, climax, boom, goes all the way down, right? It's always that same pattern. Now, of course, sometimes you can climax, right? Burst, climax again, and then and go down again. So it sort of like a double climax, right? Some people can have more than one orgasm. <laughs> um, ARK is a good example. So if you look at the ARK ETF, they contain many companies that, that are way overpriced, way uh, in a bubble. So again, if you look at ARC, on the longer term charts, again, you can see that 45 degree and then 90 degrees, whoa! <laughs> and now it looks like, you know, we could be coming down. And if we don't, it could be another climax and boom, it's gonna come down. Warning sign number two, people say that this time it's different. That's how they justify to themselves paying ridiculous prices for something that should not be worth so much. So this is when market participants who have bought that stock or bought that cryptocurrency, for example, they assure each other that, you know, this time everything is completely different and the normal rules of the financial markets no longer apply. Now, I give you an example that during the dot-com bubble, um, Yahoo was selling at a PE ratio of 1,000. And 
people paying $220 for Yahoo. People were paying uh, high prices for stocks that were not making any money and had no prospects of making money. Why? Because they justified to themselves that, hey, profits are no longer important. Sales are not important. We now have to look at eyeballs. How many people look at the website? We have to look at the clicks. As long as people click on the website, they look at the website, it's worth something. I call that major bullshit, right? So people, when they tend to be overly optimistic about the future performance of a certain asset class, they usually will say it's revolutionary. You know, it's something different. You, you can't explain it. So I see that with Tesla as well. And that's why I never, never would dare to invest in Tesla. Because again, if you look at Tesla, if you do an actual discounted cash flow analysis to figure out how much cash they could generate from their actual business, Tesla's worth like at the very most $250 at the very most. So right now, Tesla at 600 bucks is like, you know, 300% overvalued. To me, it doesn't make sense. It will eventually come down to $200. Maybe not today, maybe not next week, not next month, but it will eventually get down to 200 bucks based on what it's doing right now. And if you look at other metrics, for example, if you look at Tesla's price to sales ratio, it's 22 times price to sales ratio. That's crazy, okay? Now, if you compare, for example, Google's price to sales ratio is about eight. Uh, Amazon's price to sales ratio is like four. Tesla's like 22, okay? The price to earnings is like 1,000. And again, this reminds me of Yahoo. In the old days, people said Yahoo will change the world. Yahoo is the world's biggest search engine. It's revolutionary, right? And sure enough, the bubble burst and Yahoo dropped from, from $200 to five bucks. And people said, why didn't I see that coming? Duh, <laughs> right? And if you look at this chart, you can see, for example, if you compare Tesla with all its competitors, right? Compare Tesla with Toyota, Volkswagen, Renault, GM, Hyundai, Ford, Honda, and they're all making electric vehicles. Tesla's not the only one. Now, if you look at the number of cars they actually produce, Tesla is making this amount of cars, the one in red, compared to all the cars made by the other companies. They make a total of 121 times more cars. They sell 121 times more cars than Tesla. But if you look at the value of the stock based on the market capitalization, Tesla's market price is more than all the other companies combined. Now, does that make sense? <laughs> Not to me. <laughs> if it does to you, well, good luck. So that's warning sign number two. I'm sure the diehard Tesla fans who are listening to me on this are now losing their shit. Like, you don't know what you're talking about! Ah, what's that? Uh, which is warning sign number seven, which I'll talk about in a while. When people lose their shit over something, it's usually a bubble. Okay, warning sign number three is when aunties and uncles start joining in the party. And I've got something I call the auntie indicator. You know, in my family, I've got aunties and uncles who know nothing about investing. They've got no financial background and they're not usually interested in investing. But I realized that the moment my auntie starts to text me and say, Adam, I'd like to buy this stock or buy this asset. Well, usually that's a sign that it's going to crash because retail investors um, tend to get in near the top of a bubble. Why? Because that's when there's maximum optimism and that's when the media sensationalizes and everyone gets to know about it. Again, remember, prices move up in a 45 degree angle. Once they go up this way and they get all the media attention and they see everyone has made their money, I want to make money, that's when the amateurs start to jump in to that market. But that's usually when all the gains have already been gained, right? That's when professionals are looking to sell and that's when amateurs look to get in and that's why they always get in before a crash. So this is where people with little to no background knowledge on the respective technology or asset, they start to enter the market and worse still, they start to give tips to each other. Hey, you should buy this stock. Hey, you should buy this cryptocurrency. You should buy that. So that's my anti-indicator. And again, they get drawn in 
because of the fear of missing out, the fear uh, or the, the desire for quick profits. All right, warning sign number four is, again, related to warning sign number three. So very often, amateurs join the party because of the media. The media will tend to sensationalize very high returns and sensationalize how ordinary people have become overnight millionaires. And again, remember from history, that's when people started to buy dot-com stocks, when they talked about dot-com millionaires. That's when people entered the housing market, when they saw how many people became rich in housing, and that's how that bubble formed. So that's warning sign number four. Warning sign number five is the increased use of leverage by speculators. So what's leverage? Leverage is when you buy an asset by borrowing money. So you borrow money to buy something, that's called leverage. So if the price goes up, you make a lot more. But if the price drops, you also double your losses. So leverage is a double-edged sword. What tends to happen is that towards the end of an asset bubble, right, amateurs, they want to maximize their profits. And they see that, hey, prices have always gone up. It will always keep going up. So they've got this false sense of security. So they start to borrow money and they buy on margin because it seems that prices will always go up. It seems like a sure thing. Now, again, this has happened in every bubble. Again, before the dot-com bubble, many people were borrowing money to buy dot-com stocks. That drove up the price, it collapsed. A lot of people were over-leveraging, buying houses during the uh, 2007, 2008 housing crisis. Many people were borrowing money to buy bonds and that fueled the bond bubble that crashed in March of last year. So it's always fueled by borrowed money. And usually when speculation with borrowed money reaches new highs, it's usually a sign of a top. So look out for the amount of leverage behind the asset going up. Warning sign number six, everyone seems to be talking about it. At the workplace, you go to parties, people say to you, you gotta buy this, you gotta get into this investment. And people start to think, hey, this is so easy to make money. I could be quitting my day job, I could do this full time. That's a sign of a bubble. So again, back in 98, 99, every party I went to, everyone was talking about dot-com stocks. You gotta buy dot-com stocks. It's the future, it's the way to get rich. Again, in 2005, 2006, it was all about real estate speculation. It's all about no money down, you can buy a property, you can flip it, you can make so much money, why work anymore? This is the easy way to be financially free and you see all the books writing about it, that's a sign of a bubble. So the question is, right now at parties, at the workplace, what's the asset that everyone seems to be talking about? What's the asset that seems to be the thing that's gonna make you rich? sign number seven, when doubters and skeptics are disregarded as people who just don't get it and who are crazy for missing out on these great things that's going to change the world that's making everybody rich. And it really amazes me that every time I talk about things like, you know, Tesla's a bit overvalued, Bitcoin's a bit of a bubble, people get really upset. They lose their shit, right? Not only do they uh, disagree with me, but they get upset with me and they call me an idiot. They call me you don't know what the hell you're doing. And that's that's a bit of a sign, right? So something to think about. Dot-com stocks were in a bubble, when housing was in a bubble, when tulip mania was in a bubble. And people were investing, why didn't they see that it was irrational? Why were they in denial? It's because what makes bubbles so dangerous is that people who are in it, they don't often realize they're in it. It's kind of like you're hypnotized. You're hypnotized by that music, right? And you are just captivated so much that you will always find a way to convince yourself that these prices are justified. But eventually when the music ends, or eventually when you get sober and you look back and you think, how could I have done that? What the hell was wrong with me? But it's often too late when that happens. So now that you've learned to recognize what's a bubble, the seven warning signs, let's take a look at which asset classes do you think could be at a bubble or nearing a bubble? So let's begin with the stock market. Is the stock market in a bubble? Well, let's go through the seven warning signs. If you want to catch my latest videos, click on the subscribe button right now. 
click on the bell so you get instant notifications once I upload my latest video. If you want to check out my online courses, go to piranaprofits.com. We're going to learn how to invest and how to trade the financial markets and create an income from all around the world. If you want to join my live Wealth Academy program, go on to wealthacademyglobal.com and find out more about how you can learn investing and trading live online. This is Adam Koo and may the markets be with you.